All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Karen Hurd, who is in Laurel, Maryland today. How are you doing, Karen? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And Karen's an author, international keynote speaker named by Inc. as one of the most innovative leadership speakers. Um, in a previous life, she uh, led this huge at Verizon. She was an executive at Horizon and she was just telling me she led, what was it, 22,000 salespeople? Small little team, small little intimate sales team. <laughs> 2,200. 2,200. Yes, oh, still a lot. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Still, <laughs> still probably a great bigger sales team, than, sales team than most people will ever see. And she's also author, co-author of the book, Winning Well, A Manager's Guide uh, to, getting, to Getting Results. And, um, and so let's just start off with the whole concept. What is, what is the idea about winning well? What's the difference between winning and winning well? Let me ask you that. Yeah. So when we talk about winning well, so the subtitle is a manager's guide to getting results without losing your soul. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get results that are really breakthrough results and stay a really decent human being along the way? And uh, because we often see that people will either gravitate towards, you know, really getting driving for results, holding people accountable, you know, uh, in, in such a way that it really leaves a, a sea of bodies along the way. Mm -hmm. Right. Or you see the other way. And our research really shows that this is actually what most more people do is they fall into a category where they're really focused on relationships. They're trying to be nice. They're looking the other way. They're not having the tough conversations that need to be had. And uh, so winning well is uh, showing up with confidence and humility and then focusing on results and relationships. So when you can get all that going, that's that's what a winning well manager is. So, that's, so let's face it. I mean, most people end up in management positions, maybe they're you know, I mean, in sales, it's typical. Maybe they're top performer. They're put in as a sales manager, as you know. But but even if they're not in sales, even if they're in other disciplines, a lot of people end up in management positions without any real either management training or a mentor, any experience whatsoever. So uh, what normally happens in situations like that? And how can how can you uh, mitigate for the 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 terrible travails that some people have when they first become managers? Yeah, and that's and that is so true, and that's what's so sad. Where you see people, they're just thrown into these positions, and it happens particularly in sales, right? Mm -hmm. Because you are a rock star salesperson, and then how do you now not be just so focused on your own results, but how do you transfer that brilliance that made you so good, and how do you build that in other people? And that's what our our book is really about. It's about really practical tools and techniques. Right? How do you have a tough performance conversation, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, how do you give people feedback in a way that balances results and relationships? How do you run an effective meeting? How do you uh, focus on the most important things and keep people focused on those? And we have very uh, specific step-by-step -step guides for each of those things. Yeah. And how much does, uh, obviously, as you build these skills, how much does confidence play a part? Because it always seems to me that a lot of times when somebody comes into a management position, they feel pretty vulnerable, right? They're out on their own for the first time. Maybe they were promoted. Maybe they had friends. Now they're who are peers. Now they are subordinates. And so, as you say, they go one way or the other. They either go the total hard route of, OK, I'm in charge now and you're going to follow me. Or they're going to please help me. And they get too much on the other side where they get too relationship oriented um so how do, how do you uh, i mean how do you navigate that especially for yeah, a brand so, new manager right so you, when you think about it uh, it's really this balance of confidence and humility right so if you have just been promoted from being a salesperson, right, you know what you're good at. You mm -hmm. know how to sell. You know how to build the relationships with your customers. You know how to build rapport. You know how to, you know, get the customer thinking in a certain way. But what you, so you need to show up with that level of confidence that you do have some subject matter expertise, right? You don't want to lose that no matter what. But you also want to have the humility to say, you know what? Um, I have a lot to learn in terms of leadership and being open and willing to do that and to really build the genuine relationships and surround yourself with people who will challenge you on your team, listen to their ideas, be able to cultivate uh, what their brilliance is and understand that people are different, right? Mm -hmm. And that you're not going to be able to lead every person in the exact same way. 
Um, we have actually something we call the confidence competence model, where it's on a continuum of high confidence and low confidence and high competence and low competence. Mm -hmm. And what you really need, each person on your team needs, depends on where they fall. Right? So if somebody is highly competent and highly confident, when you're leading them, you need to be giving them stretch assignments, right? right? Uh, really challenging them. But if somebody is really, really um, competent, but they're lacking confidence, you don't need to be having tough conversations. You need to be encouraging them. And then, of course, you've got the people who are um, highly uh, confident but lack competence. They're not as good as they think they are, right? And uh, we've all worked with someone like that. <laughs> and then they need coaching, right? And mm -hmm. how, so how do you manage someone in that arena? And that's a key point you just raised there around coaching because, okay, so let's face it, a lot of people come into management positions without management skills but practically nobody has coaching skills because it's not something that's you know inherent in most people, right? It's something that has to be taught and learned. So, um, how do you how do you advise people or organizations to equip their managers to be coaches? Because what you just mentioned about managing people differently that's you know you got to be able to coach to do that well, right? Yeah, we have a model we call the Inspire model, and that's an acronym that uh, stands for a process. But it starts with I initiate the conversation, right? Then you N, notice. And when you're coaching someone, it's so important to, we're using the word notice because you can only notice a behavior. You can't notice an attitude, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a, one of the biggest mistakes we see when people are coaching is they say, you know, you just have a bad attitude. Or, you know, it, no, I've noticed that when you come into our meetings, your arms are crossed, you're looking at your phone, and you're shooting down everybody as ideas. Those are specific things to notice. S is where you provide specific supporting evidence of the, uh, the behavior you're looking to change. And then the important part of the model is then the P, where you probe. Here's where you ask open-ended questions to get the person to reflect on the behavior that they are looking to change. And then you, I, invite them to come up with solutions to the behavior. Instead of you telling them what they need to do differently, they've reflected. Now they're coming up with the idea of how they're going to fix it. And then um, R is where you review what they came up with. And then E is you enforce. So here you say, okay, thanks. I know you're going to work on this. Now you set a time that you're going to come back and talk about the behavior again. All right? So, okay, well, let's meet. We're going to have uh, two staff meetings the next two weeks. Let's meet again after the second staff meeting. And let's see. Um, if the way you've been interacting with your peers changes. Yeah. Now, I, I love that model that you've just outlined there because uh, let's face it, we're, we are experts at perceptions, right? I mean, we perceive things we f and then we fill it all out and we come up with a com composite picture of what we think is going on with very little evidence to back it up, right? So I like this idea here where you're, where you're identifying specific behaviors and then you know, getting feedback on it. Because again, as I said, if you're not very confident as a manager, you're going to perceive things very differently from people yeah. that may not be there. Um, so how, how do, uh, when you start to do this kind of, when you take a model like that, what does that lead to within a team dynamic? It's really, you know, one of the things that we find is in the organizations we work with is if you can teach that model at multiple levels of the team, Right. So uh, we're, we've been working with one organization. So we started with the executive team. Then we worked with the director team. And then we worked with the frontline management team and taught that model to, at every level. And what you find is uh, people are having now more uh, productive conversations because, you know, you can almost see the model coming on. Right. And somebody said, hey, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. Right. But. Because it is a way of pulling out uh, um, and having a productive two-way dialogue, you find that a lot of the conflict gets resolved and people have the confidence, to your point, of addressing the issues early before they fester. Because in you know it, sometimes in organizations where people are afraid of the conflict, they say somebody does something like, oh, they come in you know late and they say, oh, Surely she knows she shouldn't have come in late. I'm not going to say anything. They come in late again. Oh, of course now. This time she really knows, right? And then by the time you actually say something, you blow it. You lose your cool because there's now a pattern. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so we find that when we teach the Inspire model, people have more confidence to have a more productive conversation. 
And they it eliminates what we see as the biggest mistake with coaching, which is the person who's doing the coaching doing all the talking. Right. Because if you do that, you know, people just tune you out. Right. You're more, much more likely to change your behavior if you came up with the idea of how you're going to change. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there is a what's that rule? It's that people uh, people believe uh, conclusions they come to themselves above anything you can ever tell them. Um, so your job is to help them come to the correct conclusions. And you know the thing, yeah. And you know the thing is, salespeople. I, I loved doing leadership training with salespeople because, especially if they've not had any before, because inherently they have a lot of these skills. They mm -hmm. just don't realize they can apply them to management. Right. right. A really rock star salesperson knows you have to ask provocative questions. Knows you can't do all the talking. Knows you can't push. Right. Knows it's a relational sale the same thing in leadership. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, interesting point that you raised there. And I think great one for any of our salespeople and sales managers to take away is maybe you you actually do have the skills. It's the skills that you used when you're dealing with prospects and customers that you need then to use internally with your teams. And you know why I know this? Because when I first took on my very first sales role, I had never been in, so I was leading this big sales team. I had never been in sales my entire life. All I knew was leadership. Right. And then I was able to apply all these with the customers too. <laughs> so there you go. It proves it works both ways, right? Yeah. <laughs> and one thing you mentioned there that I just wanted to pick back up on again is this idea of conflict. And we we seem to have, I mean, maybe once upon a time things were at the other end of the scale and people were, you know, constantly in conflict in work situations but now we seem to have gone the other way where people are so conflict averse they're so afraid of having and then and now with electronics and all of that it's much easier to hide behind and be passive aggressive i mean how do you overcome that to the point where you don't go all the way back but obviously you come to yeah. a place where issues can be dealt with openly yeah, I think it really does start by building the relationships and having the trust, right? And part of that is, you know, I always say, if you knew somebody really cared about you and your career and wanted you to be successful, would you want to hear their feedback? Sure. And every time I ask that, no matter how large the audience is, the every hand goes up. Yes, I would want to hear it. And then say, okay, so how comfortable are you with giving somebody who you really care about feedback? Yeah. Right? People are afraid, but you know, so you know, other people want it. Um, so I think part of it is, you know, building the relationship and really caring about people mm -hmm. and wanting them to be successful, right? Like that sometimes when there's conflict, there's a, a relational element that is missing. Mm -hmm. And then the other is that really, you know, 95% of conflict comes down to an expectation violation of some sort, right? Right. right. I expected that you were going to empty the dishwasher before you left for work, and I came home to a dish uh, sink full of dishes. Right? Expectation violation. <laughs> I love that. That it's it's interesting though, isn't it? The what you're saying there, because um, without this, without having setting expectations, obviously you don't know the you don't know what's expected of you, and you don't know when you're violating those expectations. So it seems to me that the expectation setting is obviously a critical part before you do anything else. Yeah, you say the, you know, the best way to um, have a tough conversation is to avoid it, right? right? By not having to have it in the first place, mm -hmm. because you made the expectations so perfectly clear. Yeah. So, so that comes back to the idea of, of communication and of, of like goal setting, expectation setting. And as, as you said, so you have maybe a lot of different individuals on your team who react to things differently. So it's almost like you, I mean, would you say you have to almost create a different sort of set of expectations almost for everybody and then a global set for the team? Well, it depends that they have different roles, uh, but I think that it's really important to set, set a very clear standard of what your expectations are. And so if, you're, if you are um, leading a team of folks and they're all doing the same job, you need to have clear expectations of what, what success looks like, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if you've got uh, 15 district managers and they all have, you know, they should have similar expectations. Um, and then, you know, how they're going to meet those expectations and what support they need from you around that will vary, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on, uh, you know, where they are in terms of their own development. So if you're a, if you're a manager, maybe you've been one for a while. How do how do you know if you're starting to lose your soul? 
there's a, there's a lot of signs. Um, I, I would say first, um, you know, how do you, how do you, do you feel good about the way you're showing up and treating people every day? Right. And, or do you feel like you are being driven so hard to meet some metric that you are doing things that, um, you're not proud of. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, it was interesting that, uh, there was a one point in my career where I was under so much pressure. We had so much changing that uh, one of my directors came to me, director report and said, you're not, you're not leading like Karen anymore. Mm. And I was so glad that he told me that. And I said, what does that mean? He says, you are micromanaging, you know, and I'm like, well, here's what what I was worried about. And I I had a lot of real real big concerns, but I had to stop being as transparent as I normally am. And I was micromanaging them, trying to protect them and their Mm -hmm. jobs, but um, it was not healthy. And so I would say that was an example of when I was losing my soul. And then another is... um, do you feel energized by by the work that you're doing or, or are you just, is it just soul, sucking every, every ounce of energy out of you? Yeah. And, and therefore, I guess there's also the other point is that if you're in an organization where maybe you can't make the changes that you'd like, you can't manage in the way you like, then you probably have to find somewhere else that you can, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, sometimes that's true. I, I, the other thing I really believe strongly in is this concept of cultural oasis, um, that even if you are working in a toxic, for a toxic boss, there are things you can do to buffer your team and protect yourself and lead, and lead in the way that you want to lead. Um, what I hate is this trickle-down intimidation where you have a, a big, what we call user manager at the top, who then intimidates this group and then they intimidate that group and it all rolls downhill. And I've, I've worked for, I've worked for a really crappy boss before and I'm like, I'm not going to be that guy. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, I am still going to continue to stick to my leadership values. Um, and it's stressful, but you can survive it. I mean, if the whole environment is toxic, I think that's another choice. Right. Right. But if you, you can outlast a bad manager yeah i i mean i'm a firm believer that if you do the right thing that eventually it will stand to you maybe not in the short term and you may go through some rough um, periods and not doing the right thing may be a quicker fix but in the long run it's not going to in the long run doing the right thing always helps um okay um so uh tell everybody a little more about your book and about yourself before we run out of time here Okay, so this is the book, uh, Winning Well, A Manager's Guide to Getting Results Without Losing Your Soul. (laughs) And uh, it is really designed to be a very, very practical guide. So you can read it end to end, or you could just go to the table of contents and say, huh, how do I give someone tough feedback? Mm. How do I fire someone with compassion right, and still win well? Mm. Um, and so how do I lead a meeting that gets results that people want to attend? Right. And so uh, people, my favorite review of the book was someone said, you could have a problem on the way to work, open up the book in the parking lot, figure out the solution and go in and do it right away. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I was just looking at the table of contents <laughs> myself here. Yeah. It's very much so, uh, a, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different areas where you could find a solution in one chapter, which uh, that can't be a bad thing. And let's face it, uh, when you're in management today, as I said, it's getting more complicated for some reasons. People are more distracted. We have s- so many different generations in the workplace. I think anything that gives you practical help is a good thing. So again, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeline of CRM. Karen Hurt, it's a pleasure talking with you today. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.